right. Donna Schwartz here from the Everything Saxophone Podcast. On location, I'm actually in Savannah, Georgia. I'm at the Jody Jazz Factory. I'm here with Jody Espina. He invited me here. And you're going to be spending a day in the life at the Jody Jazz Factory. So uh, it's kind of early in the morning for the most part. And we're in the Jody Jazz Lounge. And I wanted to catch Jody when he was free because he's going to be doing a whole bunch of things today. And I just wanted to ask him a few questions. So welcome back to the podcast. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming across the country to visit us. Oh, it's been fun. It's been fun. Major, massive thunderstorm last night, though, I got to say. That was pretty crazy, <laughs> for sure. That was like, welcome here. But, but anyway, um, before you, know, you get started with all the stuff that you have to do for today, um, I think people are going to be curious about, you're in Savannah, Georgia. How did you wind up being here? You were in New York for a little bit. What made you come here? We started in 2000 in New York, and I can't remember which... During that time, from 2000 to 2008, I had three apartments. A studio apartment in the Bronx, uh, a three-bedroom apartment in Riverdale, Bronx, as the business started doing better. And then I had a live-work loft in Tribeca as the business started doing pretty good. I remember that. You went there, okay. Yeah. So that was my dream apartment. I had been in New York since 85 and all over the place. And uh, I was never leaving New York. And I had that dream place. But I, uh, I we came down here with my girlfriend, who was uh, then my girlfriend, uh, to visit my brother. And while we were here, he said, you guys should move here to take care of our mom, bring her from Tampa, Florida. And he goes, and you guys should start having kids. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Subtle hints. <laughs> right. So, you know, it was a kind of a family thing. And... It was the weekend in February 2008, and we looked at some houses. There was a house on his block that was an open house. We looked at it. it was Sunday, we had to go back to New York. Monday, I made an offer on the house. Wow. It's impetuous. Uh, but, you know, family move. We came down. We started having kids. <laughs> <laughs> we took my mom here, and, and uh, we started building, you know, slowly, about a year later, we we came to this location and slowly built this factory. Um, so that's how we did it. What? So what year exactly was that? 2008, we came down here. Wow. Two, so, now I'm trying to remember because I still have, <laughs> I still have the Jody Jazz classic mouthpiece. Yeah. That, um, gosh, did I get that in the year 2000 or 2001? Probably. Then you came to the Bronx. No, then I didn't. All right. Did then we. And we moved to maybe 2005, we moved down to, to Tribeca. Got it. Okay, so I think I got the classic, and then I have my Alto DV, I had the, got the Tenor DV6 and the Alto DV7. Yeah. So that was, yeah, so it was around like 2006-ish or so when I got that. I remember walking up the steps and stuff like that, and um, you were behind the counter. I remember that, too. You were so helpful. I remember that. That was so awesome. <laughs> Oh my God, what a blast from the past. So cool. So you're here since 2008. And then, you know, like how many rooms did you have here? You know, talk about that. Yeah, we moved. uh, I mean, we had this, this is like a, this, not a strip mall, but kind of these units, they're condominium units. And each one is 1500 square feet. And this one was already kind of split into offices, not where we are here, but when you walk in, it was had three offices and in the back it was open warehouse space got it so we put our first two machines back there and uh we had the office space up front and where we are now is part of this big two units three thousand square feet that was next door okay and so i bought those when they became available and i sat it was all open and i sat in here in the summer and i would just sit in this big open space and i would think about how I could shape it and and this space came into my mind and I I got architect software and I I did everything you see (laughs) was in the software wow um the the the, the total design and then I designed my office and then the the other part and we built another workroom in there we we eventually built upstairs um for the yeah we've been we're totally out of space now (laughs) <laughs> and you'll see on the tour, but <laughs> but uh, we've been, you know, eking out every little inch of workspace that we can in here. 
Wow, yeah, and you've you've grown, and you know what? That's the other thing I wanted to talk about too. You've grown massively since since when you started, and then two thousand six, and when when you came here. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. So, could you you know, starting out two thousand six, you know, people are starting to get to know your name and that kind of thing. Yeah. The evolution to where you are now, where you're taking trips all over the world. Well, I started doing that early on, even before, like my second year, I took a trip to Europe and I, I got a couple accounts just going door to door and being laughed out of most places. Uh, but wow, got, you know, a couple of good accounts. And then I went to Frankfurt every year, which was a music mesa. And I got started building that. I started going to China early on, uh, which has become one of our best customers. So I've always traveled. Um, so the growth happened when we we had five employees in New York when we left, and then one guy came with me, and I hired somebody else. So I only had two employees when I got here. At that time, I didn't have a factory. Yeah, mouthpieces were being made for me by Runyon, um, and okay. Barry Woodwinds was our first hard rubber. But we were fixing most of everything. We were hand working everything okay. here, and that's why we had a good reputation because we always still play tested everything tweaked and we still play test everything now um but you know it was getting this factory and slowly getting my own control control of my own destiny control of the the quality and uh so we started you know adding employees and oh it, it, the pandemic right before the pandemic we had 15 employees and steadily through the pandemic we kept growing actually and we have 25 employees now wow five cnc machines and uh you know we like i said we're we can't grow anymore hardly in this space so we may have to expand we'll see <laughs> i was talking with danielle and you'll see her later danielle walker um about space and and how um yeah you guys may definitely need to expand very soon for sure but how okay this is a more question i guess coming from me because i can't even imagine this i don't have this kind of this kind of mind so to speak but you know i i saw what it was in new york and then you know you didn't have a factory then you came here you had a factory i guess you have to learn the types of machines that you need and and um yeah just being on top of the times in terms of what's available and what you can do big huge learning curve yeah um We've been through a few machinists. Uh, often, the artist and the, the engineer, it's, it's a hard communication. It's a hard communication. They think differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and really, our, our success in the last many years, eight or ten years, is because of my like partnership with my engineer. Um, he came in working mouthpieces. He was hand working the mouthpieces in the back and then he had an engineering degree and he came in and and he understands so that's that's important and and we've learned so much like nobody's going to tell you how to do a mouthpiece on a machine on a cnc machine they make anything so we have to figure out how to make a mouthpiece on them then we have to figure out all kind of stuff how to make the curve the facing curve like a hand curve because it just doesn't do itself no matter how advanced these machines are and how accurate they are they're not accurate unless you you know will it into being yeah <laughs> it's it's we learned so much we learned something yesterday a really cool thing oh. I'm not telling you what it okay. is but <laughs> <laughs> i mean awesome. <laughs> all the time but <laughs> yeah all kind of secrets but but uh wow it's and so we haven't you know, a tray of 100 mouthpieces now, it rarely is there uh, a reject. But, you know, uh, 10 years ago, there'd be three or four or five, and, and you know, we'd we work them or something, but it's just gotten better and better. Yeah, you know, I keep thinking to myself, too, um, you know, from yesterday when I came into today as well, you know, just how, gosh, how things have gotten so advanced and stuff like that. Now there's 3D... 3D printers and that kind of thing, and, and and it's not necessarily in advance because of the material. Oh, okay. Because the material is so coarse, and if you check a, a, a nice hand-faced mouthpiece and you check our table and our rails, feel it. Yeah, yeah. Feel how smooth it's like glass, and that enables that reed to really sit beautifully. And when it 
closes its seals for a second, that pop test, right. all that. And so there's a, it's a convenient technology, but it's not there yet um, for me. And uh, so, and, and, you know, who knows, it probably will, day, will be, could be. In our lifetimes, but, yeah, yeah. It, it very well may be. But yeah. at this point, you know, the CNC machining and all that kind of thing is, it's, is yeah. It's for me the, the finish and the precision because um, the facing curve is everything. I'll just, I just need a hat that says the facing curve is everything. <laughs> um, you should get a T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> and Jody Jazz on the back. Yeah. <laughs> just a thought. <laughs> next, next marketing ploy, so to speak. But so, okay, so we've evolved. We've come here. You've grown during the pandemic, yeah. right? Yeah. And so now you have more workers here. And, 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 you know, you're expanding all over the world. You know, and you just came back from a trip to Asian countries. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, we were locked out of there since the pandemic. So yeah. I usually, I go to China every year to the show. It's called the Music Mesa. Um, and then sometimes when I'm there, I do performances. There's a big giant stage. I do a couple, do performances in the booth. So we've been building our brand. Most American companies just let their distributor go there and they don't even have a presence. So we've always had that presence and we bring artists. Then after the show, sometimes we'll go into the country and you know go to these cities and wow. do clinics and stuff. So we've been working over there. One thing, actually one theme that I'm seeing is that your, your thinking is ahead of the game. Like, you know, even before when you said, you know, I was thinking that you were going to wait to get established before you start going all over the place. But no, you didn't. You went all over the place to get established. Yeah. And yeah. you're doing the same thing. You've done the same thing in, in the Asian countries yeah. as well. So like, like I said, we were, we were um, locked out. I go to China every year. I go to every other year to Japan. And w usually when I go to Japan, I'll hit one of several places. This time I went to Korea. We have a new distributor there and they they just went all out they ordered a ton and we did concerts and clinics and recordings um wow. uh so taiwan is p moyat's our distributor they're friends since like 2003 wow. and um 20 years we so we, we've been through it all together really and uh they're they're so great we did stuff there japan I did a bunch of interviews for uh, magazines. They have these cool sax magazines. I heard. Yeah. Yeah. They're, and uh, so I did interviews for both of those, um, videos and, you know, clinics for people and stuff. So it, it was a really valuable trip. That you can't replace that. Um, FaceTime with people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Something we've, we've kind of unfortunately forgotten about since the pandemic. Yeah. For the most part. So... It was well worth the trip. I had a great time. I ate, I've been over there to Asia so many times, but I ate like five or six meals that were totally foreign to me. You know, oh, that's new cool. experiences. That was, that's cool. That's always cool. Yeah. Well, now listen, so we've talked about how, you know, part of your year, so to speak, is doing a lot of traveling. What's a typical day for you like? Uh, get here about... Now, when I don't have to take my son to the bus stop, I'm getting here at 5.30. Um, oh, my God. I'm alive at that when time. When I have to take him to the bus stop, I'm getting here at a little before 7. And uh, last year, I started. I got into golf. Uh, so I built a simulator here. This is We're standing on a golf simulator. <laughs> this is so crazy. This is our stage <laughs> where we play. and uh, but, but I was able to put like an extra part of it. And this is a screen that you can hit balls into and the, <laughs> the it's a golf course projected on there it's a really good simulator so it's been very good for my head because it's my first hobbies you know since i quit sports when i was a kid to play music full time I got it okay so it's been really cool learning something new and it's it goes so much into teaching and understanding how amateurs are learning saxophone and how I can relate to them and what their process and journey is. And equipment is part of that, you know. And so I did a clinic in England, a saxophone weekend uh, last month. And I was, so many times I mentioned golf because I, I said, I understand what you're going through. I, yeah. through. 
through this. It's, it's been really interesting that way, too. Yeah, you know, most people don't even think about that as well. You know, like when you're learning something new, whether it's an instrument, whether it's a sport or drawing or some kind of craft or whatever, the whole thought process, you know, um, and the emotional process that goes on too as yeah. well especially if you're really good at something and then you're learning something as a beginner sometimes that's really hard that's mm. really hard for people to deal with yeah i'm loving it and i'm i of course i want to be really good i'm kind of intense that way and so i'm i'm getting here early as soon as i can i'm practicing a couple hours uh a day at least and like you said, it clears your head yeah. so you can get ready for the day. And then so, you know, like you're getting here early, you know, getting things opened up, all that kind of thing. And then yeah. what, what happens? So um, probably got to check email. I always have a list of things to do. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, arrange travel or, or um, you know, reach out to certain people. I've got a, a, a big crew here that you'll see. And they really do most everything. Everybody's got a job. So... I'm not like in the weeds on stuff. My real job here is the R&D, the research and development, the Got prototyping, it. and um, quality control, keeping my hand and everything. Um, because it, any, no matter what the process is, if you let it go, something will happen and it'll, somebody will forget some process or something. So you gotta stay in that. Um, everybody knows the customer service has to be perfect and I'm, you know, I'm around, but I have such good people that they, everybody's doing their job. So I'm focused on the mouthpieces and uh, then the selling, like making videos here, which I should do more of. Um, <laughs> You're so busy. That's the only but, thing. You know, making those educational videos or demo videos and then getting out there and being the, you know, Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm the... <laughs> <laughs> the spokesperson awesome. uh so so i get out there and i love doing it i love going into band rooms i'll get in the truck with a, a ed rep you know these school music dealers they have the guy who goes to the band room every week he goes these guys go out to 40 40 bands a week wow and they deliver rentals and all this stuff i'll get in the van with the guy and i'll go to every band and we'll say what do you want jody to do to the band director Wow. Well, let them sit in with the band, let them direct the band, let them take the saxes and work with them, whatever. So it's always something new. That's cool. And I, I love that. That's cool. Yeah. And the great thing, too, so we were talking beforehand, this is also, you know, his studio where he shoots his YouTube videos. And you're one of the few people that, you know, you can play. I mean, when I interviewed Ed Kaya for the podcast, you know, he was saying, yeah, Jody's great. You could play. He, Ed Kaya said, you've got he thinks like you're one of the, one of the greatest sounds too. Uh -huh. So yeah. So, <laughs> wow. but, it's but a monster, yeah. he's a monster. He's a monster player himself, but you can play and you play so well. And I've always said that and I believe yes. it. I'm not just saying it because we're here. I really, I really mean it. Um, so when he does his, his, when he has a new mouthpiece, you look on his YouTube channel, he's demoing it. And you get a chance to really hear what that mouthpiece can do. And this is the spot that you're doing it. And I think that's really cool. But you also you, you also tell me that you have rehearsals here, too. Yeah. We, you started something new here. We, we have the Jody Jazz Band. That's so cool. Uh, ten people from the crew. No ringers, no outsiders. Um, and we started doing it. and Because I want to make a film of the crew. Uh, people always say, thank you, Jody, for the mouthpiece. And I want to say, well... It's not just me. Let's see how that came to be. Um, so that started in my mind, and I thought, you know, let's let's get the band back together because we tried a long time ago, and uh, so because I want to show, you know, the the versatility of the people here. There's a lot of musicians here, and that makes a difference. Um, I think, you know, not to get metaphysical or something, but. We, we do things in a high-tech way, but we still have a lot of hands on these mouthpieces. And I think when, when there's this intention of people working something, and, and my intention is that this mouthpiece can help you express yourself, help you have joy through music. Yeah. I think there's something there rather than something just popped out of a, uh, you know. A machine. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 
so and the and the these people are musicians and we've been playing uh i think this will only be like fifth rehearsal maybe a fourth or fifth rehearsal but we've been doing a variety of music everybody's coming from a different point of view our bass chair is by a concert tuba player he's with the savannah philharmonic he's a monster yeah. but he's he's doing the grooves our, you know our drummer plays every kind of music he's in a a really good country band but he does all kind he's burning um we got our horn section five horns two guitars those guys are from the rock world and they're working the jazz and we're going to do some rock with them and so i'm having fun i'm really surprised (laughs) uh because it's not like usually when you get a band together you call all your guys you call all your you know you cover each chair with but this is kind of who we got this is and it's working and it's fun so. yeah you know what's interesting with this too um all you know musicians and stuff like that this also for those people that are listening watching the podcast or whatever or know younger students uh younger people that are looking to go into music music isn't just about performance there's opportunities you know to work with people that create mouthpieces that create products and stuff like that that need musicians because we need that 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 um that background, that sensibility, in order to make their products better. Yeah, that was a real surprise to me, getting into the music products business and going to these shows like the NAMM show and, and make, becoming friends with all these different companies. Um, it's because I thought business people were just greedy. Uh, you know, I was just a musician, right, in New York. Yep, and yep, I got, yep. fell into this. And... Uh, and I had a dim view of business people and I'll find a lot of really cool, nice people. Um, You know, take, take the cannibal guys, for example, they're all players from top to the bottom, all can play. They have a company band that's really slick, quite good. Wow. Uh, Wow. And I think they bring in a couple of rhythm section players and stuff. But if you get to hear their videos, you know, we're, we're like the, the funky, dirty, sloppy band they're the slick really good but we'll see we're going to give them a run for their money one of these days <laughs> oh, my, oh my god i almost <laughs> hear a challenge a challenge yeah. coming <laughs> i challenge you guys well give us a little while <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome well one more question before we go because i know you're going to have a tour coming in what do you see for the future of jody jazz you know in the in the short term it's it's i got a runway of products we're working on I have a really cool mouthpiece in my mind um, uh, and you never know I always have opportunities to make different things to put my you know I don't want to just put my name on something yeah, yeah. like put my name on a reed or put my name on a saxophone or or sometimes I want to make trumpet mouthpieces and brass mm. mouthpieces but we've got two great brass players here um, really great so we have could have a kind of a point of view but it, it's we have enough to do just with what we're doing so i'm not ruling anything out but mostly i'm just focused on the runway of, of mouthpieces you know we we released this dvhr it's doing great it's our best release ever our hand hammered thing was a super success that we'll start making those in regular gold and selling those Man, in Asia, you can't believe it. Um, you'll see this presentation today. Um, these adult amateurs, they, they like to buy the top stuff. And uh, so I got a, you know, Shedville clarinet stuff in the works, Rousseau stuff in the works, classical saxophone, um, all kind of junk. So <laughs> so that that's the basic thing. And we'll see if we have to expand more. To me, it's not out of avarice or greed or something that no. we're expanding. To me, business in, in like a plant, a plant has to grow. <laughs> and and uh, a business, it, I'm afraid if I don't grow, we might slide back and then I can't pay everybody. Right, right. Everybody gets paid. Yeah. Uh, so that main thing of making sure you can pay everybody. And for that, I, I have to grow a little bit, so... Well, you've definitely grown so much. And listen, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I've got to let you get ready for your presentation. Thank you so much. We'll do some more stuff today. So thanks a lot. Absolutely. All right.